Hey, everybody. Good afternoon. It is a rainy, rainy afternoon here up in Vermont. I don't know where you are. We were just chatting with Sonia in Arizona, and she said it was 106 degrees there. I can't even fathom that temperature right now. Um, if you can just let me know, can you see me? And can you hear me out in the questions box just to let me know that everything is working okay today? So please post in the questions box. Can you see me? Can you hear me? And also feel free to introduce yourselves and um, let us know who you are and where you're from. So just let me know on that. Um, I'm not seeing anybody responding, which worries me. Uh, is anybody out there? Please respond and let me know. Hmm. There you go. Thank you so much. Yep, Donna, hello, hello, hello. Hey, Julie, hello, hello. Julie Jacobson from Spay, Tennessee is here. Carlona, excellent, excellent. And Donna, hello, it's great to see you all. Thank you again for tuning in. This is going to be our last pop-up panel for a while. I'm putting the pop-up panels on pause, all these P words here <laughs> with the PPP. This is my PPP plan. Um, <laughs> so we're gonna put those pop-up panels on pause. Um, I will bring them back if needed. So always give me a shout out. Let me know if you think we need to bring them back. Uh, Kristen and I are hard at work with regards to planning the online kitten conference, which is gonna be June 12th through the 14th. If you don't know anything about the online kitten conference, feel free to check it out at onlinekittenconference.com. We have a great lineup of uh, attendees. I think it's like 18, or even maybe more than that now. We have uh, Dr. Ellen Jefferson has just been added as a last minute addition. So she'll talk about kittens and coronavirus and all that fun stuff together, how it's been impacted, the kittens have been impacted by coronavirus. So anyway, so I hope you'll all join us at the online kitten conference, uh, June 12th through 14th. And again, it's onlinekittenconference.com. For those of you that are the trappers, the crazy trappers out there, folks that want to learn about the drop trap, we have our drop trap, uh, the trapper's best friend, which is being presented by Neighborhood Cats. That is going to be June 27th, and that will be from 2 to 4 p.m. Eastern time. And you can find out more information on that. That is a free we webinar uh, that is sponsored by Tomahawk Traps. You can go to communitycatspodcast.com. And you can um, sign up for the free webinar there. And that's going to be, as I said, June 27th uh, from 2 to 4 p.m. Eastern time. So please do join us for that. Uh, another perk of being part of these events, and I will send you an inv invitation, is we have the online cat conference Facebook page. You can feel free to sign up to join that Facebook page. And that's a special place where we put special items. Ooh, and going back to online kitten conference, just want to tell you um, as a registration perk for the online kitten conference, there's a CDE is cages is donating a $900 cage. And one of the registrants will be able to get one of those cages pulled out into a, um, in a drawing. So that will be a surprise perk for anyone who's attending the online <laughs> kitten conference. We also have an affiliate opportunity and we have a couple of days left if you want to sponsor the conference. Sponsorships are available. Uh, you can just email me at stacy at communitycatspodcast.com. Okay, so excellent. Thanks so much folks for tuning in and I want to do a big shout out and a thank you to our panelists today who uh, is Donna uh, Sicaranzo and Sicaranza, apologize on that one, Donna Sicaranza from Team uh, Mobile Clinic in Connecticut. And we also have Sonia Hernandez from Fix, Adopt and Save in Arizona, where it is hot, hot, hot at 106 degrees. Can't, I just, I'm still, here I am, see I have my buff. I have my buff, I was out walking and I had that on my face. So anyway, um, all right. So um, what I would like to do first is a quick poll because this is my last day. So I'm gonna have to do a lot of polls. Um, First poll is, where are you from? All right, we close the poll and share the results. So we have 63% from the Eastern United States, 6% from the middle part of the state, 25% from Western US and 6% outside of the United States. So that's great. And one quick other poll, 
if you are part of a clinic, is your clinic open? Yes, um, or yes, but only for emergencies, and no, we're totally closed. Super. I'm gonna close this poll and share the results. So 40% are open, pretty much as normal. 50% are open, but only for emergencies. And then 10% um, are no, we are totally closed. I'm gonna hide those results. Excellent, excellent. Donna, are you out there? I'm here. Excellent, you sound perfect. All I'm right, tired, Donna, um, the microphone is now yours. Thank you for coming. Okay. Thank you for inviting me and thank you to everybody who's attending and out there. We're all still uh, trying to do our, our best in the midst of this pandemic. I am the executive director of an organization called Tate's Every Animal Matters, uh, also known as TEAM, and we are headquartered in Westbrook, Connecticut. In 1997, my late partner uh, and I co-founded a mobile spay-neuter clinic for cats that is known as the Team Mobile Feline Spay-Neuter Clinic. Um, he was a veterinarian, Dr. John Caltabiano, and my background is in public relations and marketing. And um, we launched the clinic specifically to address feline overpopulation here in Connecticut. Um, just nothing new for everybody in, in this organ, you know, in this group here. We're all committed to preventing the birth of unwanted cats and uh, kittens. So we have been on the road every day throughout the state of Connecticut since 1997. Our uh, mobile clinic travels to 25 to 30 locations statewide, and we perform on average about 30 surgeries daily. Um, at the height of our program, I would say in 2008, 2006 through maybe 2008 or so, we had two clinics on the road every day um, and we were averaging about 40 surgeries daily. Over the years, um, many changes have taken place in the state, which has had an impact somewhat on our ability to provide these services at that high volume. Um, and also there have been, thankfully, many other opportunities for people to have access to low cost services. So um, we've gone from the height of the program over the course of the last 12 years or so to a very comfortable one clinic out on the road doing 30 or so surgeries a day at what we think is a much more leisurely pace. So, you know, we're going along and making a difference. We just topped 200,000 surgeries and um, the coronavirus comes along. So we have been stopped in our tracks since March 18th. Um, those of you on the East Coast, I'm sure know, you know, just Connecticut, we're smack in between New York and Boston. And in particular, Connecticut has a very high number of folks in it who work in New York City. Uh, Fairfield County, Connecticut is really a bedroom community of New York. And we were one of the first states to be particularly hard hit as the pandemic started to take hold. Um, the nature of our clinic is such that it was impossible for us to continue to provide spay neuter services in any kind of safe way. Um, the governor of Connecticut did close the state for all but essential businesses. I'm sure any of us could argue that spay neuter is essential, but it really did not fit, of course, the definition of the services that could be provided. So um, on the 18th of March, we pulled our mobile clinic off the road and we have been on hiatus ever since. Um, we canceled over 600 surgeries that had been scheduled from that date through the end of April. Um, we hadn't yet begun booking May dates. So, you know, we're feeling this just like everybody else, not only in terms of all of these cats that are not being spayed or neutered, but also we don't have an income at the moment. Um, we do charge a fee for service. And although that wasn't something that we could make, you know, money doing, we are not for profit and we did operate and do operate at a, a loss. Um, having a source of income certainly is important. You know, we do not live by donations alone. 
Um, we were fortunate to have been able to apply for the payroll protection program uh, PPP loan, which we did receive to help us get through a couple of months of payroll, um, which is our greatest expense, quite honestly. We have a paid staff. Most of us have been here since the start. So, um, you know, we we have nice jobs. We make a decent living wage, um, but it's a financial hit to the organization, of course, to be without a source of income. Uh, not to mention the fact that all of us are in our 50s in this organization, late 50s. So we had all, not only the financial concerns and the concern about the cats not getting done, but very realistic health concerns about keeping the staff safe. So all of those things came together to um, really make it obvious that we could not be on the road. Just today, our veterinarian, Dr. Art Heller, and I, and our staff of two techs and two ladies in the office part-time who book appointments met, and we decided that we are gonna try to get back out there on June 15th, once Connecticut's governor um, lifts, starts to lift the restrictions on businesses. Um, governor Lamont um, is saying that businesses can start opening with some limitations going slowly on May 20th. Like everyone, our concern is that, you know, the first couple of weeks after restrictions are lifted, time will tell whether or not cases are gonna to continue to rise or are we gonna lose all of the ground that we had made in sort of start, starting to flatten the curb. So we're concerned. Um, again, just based on the nature of anybody who's doing mobile spay neuter, just based on the nature of how you deliver those services, it's going to be a challenge for us to make sure we can do this safely, not only to protect the well-being of our staff, but our clients also. Um, one of the ways we will be doing that, of course, is to limit our number of surgeries. We are going to aim to do 15 surgeries a day every other day. So it will give us a chance to work um, and, of course, put in place um, protocols for safety and sterility on the day that we're doing surgery but on the off day in between to really give our mobile clinic a thorough going over, go back out on the road the next day. Um, so we're limiting to 15 surgeries a day. And we are also greatly limiting the number of locations that we will go to of the 25 locations. Connecticut is a very small state and uh, becoming more densely populated all the time. Um, where we are on the Connecticut shoreline, we're right along the I-95 corridor um, you know, so we have opted now to stay away from uh, Fairfield County, which borders New York, New Haven County, which is making its way up. You know, if you look at where the New York City is following I-95, we're going to try to stay out of our Fairfield County locations, New Haven County locations. Any of our big populated cities, unfortunately, are places we are going to try to avoid. Um, the catch with that, of course, is that that is where there is a very needy population of folks who need to use our services. So that's a little bit tricky, but we have other locations uh, a little further out from those cities that we think people can get to. So it, initially, that will be the plan. We will concentrate a lot of our time in the northeast part of our state, which has been the least hard hit by the pandemic. Um, we are going to just, you know, implement more safe distancing at check-in, stagger our check-in time a little bit, um, refuse admittance to any cat that's coming in a carrier that, um, even though we are going to sterilize, you know, wipe down the carriers when the client shows up for check-in, if they come in a really crummy looking dirty carrier and the client is not wearing a mask and the client is not adhering to those, adhering to those uh, protocols, those clients are going to have to unfortunately be told to reschedule their appointment. Um, our staff on board the mobile clinic is going to adjust how they do things inside uh, again, just to make sure we are being as safe as possible. And um, really just see how it goes, making sure that none of the staff start to feel that they're getting a runny nose or chills or fever, because if that's the case, then we come off the road and we take another breath and we wait and see. 
the safety and well-being of the people is of the utmost importance. Um, and we will also wait and see what happens once other businesses are back open. You know, how, um, what's going to happen is the, you know, cases, caseload going to start to spike again. So it's really a wait and see. Um, we are just taking it day by day now, like everybody else. And um, I feel like I've been rambling on and on a little bit. I apologize for that. But the team program, in a nutshell, we're out there and have been out there every day doing our part, cats only. Um, we do not ask for proof of need for to use the program. So anybody who has a cat in Connecticut is welcome to call and make an appointment. Um, that has been the case since the start. It will continue to be the case now because there will be more people than ever who are on a restricted income. We um, of our surgery load, I would say, are at a 10% of domestic cats. I'm sorry, 10% of our surgeries are feral cats. The balance are domestic cats owned by people from all walks of life. Um, but during this time, we are going to focus just on the cats too that are presenting in the most dire situations, spraying male cats, female cats in heat. Um, we typically ask that all cats be five months or eight, five months of age or older before they come aboard for spay neuter services. But you know, we do make room for cats that are four months of age, et cetera. We're going to really try to focus these limited number of appointments um, and make them available to those cats who are in the most dire need of spay neuter services um, so that they are not abandoned, tossed out the door. All the things that people do when they can't stand their cat's behavior anymore. You know, a spraying tomcat gets tossed, an in you know, female cat in heat, the client. Uh, we had some client tell us the other day it was our fault her cat was pregnant because we weren't available to do spay neuter. So I'm sure we all deal with that type of situation. And what we are going to do every day while we're out there is just try and ensure that we provide services to those most in need. Um, Really, that's where we are right now. That is the program. That's how we do it. That's what we do. And uh, we do take, uh, just before I kind of put it out there, if anyone has a question or what have you, our services are cash only and our appointments are booked by hand, people calling on the telephone. We don't do things online. We don't usually take credit cards. We are going to make a change to that now. We're going to ask everyone whenever possible to prepay using a credit card at the time the appointment is booked so that we can limit the amount of cash that changes hands at check-in. Great. I think that Great. is us in a nutshell. <laughs> Donna, thank you so very uh, much. And we'll do Q&A after yeah. um, we hear from, from Sonia. So if you want to see if this works. There you go. There you go. Beautiful. Bye, Beautiful. Bye. Excellent. All right. Microphone is yours. Okay. So thank you, everybody. Um, this is Sonia Hernandez. I'm with Fix It Up, Save. I'd like to thank you as well um, for this opportunity, Stacey, to chat with everybody, let people know what we're doing here um, in our part of the valley in Maricopa County. Um, first of all, too, if I'm talking too loud, just let me know. I'm not used to the little headset here. Um, but basically, we we are running a little bit different than most people are in speaking to many from across the country that I've uh, kept in touch with. We started, let me jump back real quickly. So Fix It Up Save actually is an initiative here in Maricopa County that started back in 2012 to put forth different programs and efforts to decrease the number of animals coming into the shelters, primarily into our animal control and our humane society and a few of the other local small ones. With that, we have put in over four and a half million dollars into spaying and neutering that is no cost to the community, as well as free vaccinations and free microchipping. With all that money put forward in different programs, both mobiles, um, also starting our voucher program in where I contract and partner up with 14 vets from across the county to assist in a yearly program for our residents. We do fund anywhere between six to 10 mobiles as well a month. And again, providing that access, the accessibility for people to get their animals spayed or neutered. Those efforts have decreased the number of animals coming into the shelter by 87%. So we've been able to decrease intake from well over 87,000 a year down to a little less than 50,000. With that, of course, of course, come hand in hand euthanasia. 
euthanasia has dropped about 86%, so well over 30,000 a year, down to just below 5,000 last year. So Fix It Up Save, again, it's a program I manage um, that provides continual consistent assistance to the public in a variety of ways, being able to help them get their animals spayed or neutered, both cats and dogs. As well with that, our program also funds trap neuter return here through our partner program, Animal Defense League of Arizona, who also does uh, spay Arizona. So all, putting all those components together uh, is how we function, what we do to assist the community and provide those services. With that, my hands are in things a little bit more because of my background and what I've done over the course of my 18 years here in animal welfare and having also a veterinary technician background in high volume in a mobile and having those friendships as well with many of the veterinarians that we work with. So that kind of a little bit of history on Fix It Up Save. Again, we are a little bit different than most. We're not an actual clinic. We are more or less a funder, but also put the programs directly ourselves into the community. I co-manage us to ensure we're doing what we do appropriately by the means of our funders, what our coalition is uh, out there to do, to do the right thing for the community and also to service the community and what they need. Now, that being said, when all of this started happening uh, back in early March, when the first when the first phase of it happened and uh, the social distancing and the restrictions came in play, we actually still were funding mo majority of the clinics here in the valley. Uh, most of them did not halt their services. It was left up to the veterinarians, frankly, to make their decision of what they felt was essential to keep going. Of course, keeping in mind their supplies for PPE and other guidelines. So that being said, a few clinics did shut down. They started running low on supplies um, and or they did follow the strong recommendations from some of the national groups as well as the governor that spay and neuter was not considered an essential surgery unless it was an emergency. Other clinics on the other hand did stay open. They did uh, change their protocol, of course, that is number one and that still is taking place now for those that have opened up as the non-essential ban our strong recommendation was lifted as of the 30th of April. So that being said, once all this started taking place, the changes on how to service the public, how to provide check-in assistance, how to discharge, all of those started being worked on immediately. And with that, for the clinics that remained open, those that closed, and then now that those that have reopened have implemented those changes. So those include anything that, um, has drive up included. So for some mobiles that are able and that were able to find a location where they have a nice big parking lot, it makes it easy. Park the mobile on the corner, people drive up, everybody stays in their vehicle, and the staff, one or two or three of them, will go out to their vehicles, provide the paperwork, it's minimal human-to-human uh, -human contact, animal is provided through the window or out the door, you know, whichever way, and then from there they go on to the mobile, surgeries are performed, and then discharge runs the same way. Some of the brick and mortar clinics uh, started doing that as well too for those that had large enough space. They were able to have kind of a little drive up service, kind of in a little U-turn, you know, little U-shape type of um, method or path. One of our um, major players here in the Valley, Altered Tales, who uh, is fantastic, our high volume clinic, they provide about 22,000 surgeries a year here. They opened back up on April 30th, and what they did is actually started to just uh, service the feral cat community. So with them, it was TNR and that they're still doing that right now and squeezing in some of the, uh, hu uh, sorry, the dog appointments that were canceled from back in late March into the appointments now, but primarily focusing on feral cats, um, some own cats, but again, feral because it makes it easy for discharge and pickup, because again, a little bit less of that human to human contact. And for some of our brick and mortar clinics that have smaller space, what they started to do is check in by call or text. So the client shows up for the appointment in the morning, from there the client then calls them and they are given a special phone number. And then the clinic staff is aware that somebody is there for check-in or for pickup, therefore walking outside and again, service, servicing them at their vehicle instead of having them come into the lobby. Because we still do have all of those social distancing restrictions. That hasn't been changed as of yet. So it's still six feet and no gathering of people. I think it's more than uh, six or 10 right now at a time. But regardless of that, 
the uh, lobby and the limit of people is being decreased within all the brick and mortar clinics. Um, as for us in funding, now that the non-essential surgeries are back in play for both human and animal related, um, we are working on obtaining more funding because the number of calls for the assistance has spiked. This is something we saw even when this first started. For the few clinics that closed down, even those few clinics and the decrease of spay and neuter capacity at all the others that might have limited and decreased it to decrease the number of people walking in, we were able to see that and that ripple effect into the community. So people that even had our vouchers that we distributed prior to this weren't able to get an appointment right away with their vets. So now we're extending the dates on those, those expiration dates to be able to honor and assist those people as the clinics now are opening up, but we know can still only take a limited amount of people. So it's gonna take a while to catch up to where we were because for us being closed one month basically even for just a few of the clinics is well over 2,500 surgeries that we know right off the bat were not being performed. Um, so I hope that, that kind of gives some background kind of where we're at. So for the future, it's basically just kind of keeping, you know, touching base with everybody on a continuous basis, which again, in my role is fantastic in being a funder, but also co-managing some of the spay and neuter and the appointments and all that that takes place that I'm able to have that partnership and that relationship with the vets, which I love because everything we do goes hand in hand. As much as, you know, we need them, they need us to work with them and then the community. So we just make it all work and we're all just, we all know we have to just keep at it keep moving forward, obtain a little bit more money, however we can if possible, because we know that influx is already starting and is gonna continue for the next few months. So for, again, for us, we're upping the number of mobiles into the communities. So next month I'm looking at having between 10 to 12 and the same is gonna go for July as well too. So kind of hope that helps a little bit. Let's people know um, again, what we're doing here, we are lucky with our weather in a sense that it doesn't rain and it doesn't snow, but for us, we do deal with the heat. Um, so sheltering in place, all of those things for some of us is kind of normal, uh, considering that four months out of the year is as well over 100 degrees. Um, but again, I hope that information helped. You're all welcome to ask any questions and even contact me after the fact um, for any other little minor details because I can go on and on. Thank you. Great, excellent. Thank you so much. Um, so we're going to go into the Q and A section. First question for you is: What does team charge for services? That's a good question. I realized listening to Sonia that I left that out. Team charges what at at present we charge one hundred and thirty five dollars for a spay or a neuter, and uh, that fee does include a brief exam vaccinations against rabies, distemper, upper and lower respiratory infection, a nail trim, and an ear mite treatment if the cat needs it. Um, we do offer a $55 rebate off of that fee for a feral cat. And we work with the state of Connecticut's Department of Agriculture and their animal population control program. So there are folks that come to us with vouchers and this further reduces the cost of surgery. Um, we, when we started out, I think we charged initially 25 years ago, $25. Um, but here in Connecticut, it's even with offset through funding and through some of our own endowment money, it's hard to make ends meet even on the 135, as I'm sure everybody knows, but um, it is still considerably less than what is charged in Connecticut's typical stationary clinic. So we're busy even at that price. Most people can afford it. Yeah, it, why the Catmobile in Massachusetts, the mobile spay neuter clinic that the Merrimack River Feline Rescue Society runs, you know, also has that same issue. And um, I mean, the only reason we have a Catmobile is because Dr. Caltabiano came up in 1998 and spoke at our annual meeting. And mm -hmm. I said, I said, I want one of those. <laughs> I remember that very well. Yep. And you have done tremendously. He would be very psyched to see what was going on. Yeah. Yep. It took us 10 years to get a Catmobile, but we, we, we persevered and we got it. So sure thanks did. to Dr. Dr. Yep. Brady, who's on the Catmobile. So she's still That's out wonderful. there every day. Yep. Yep. That's and uh, so he, he was a great personality. 
Yeah, he believed he didn't care uh, what anybody else thought, which is unusual. Um, he felt if you weren't part of the solution, you were definitely part of the problem. Yep. Uh, Follow-up question to your fees. Uh, does that include pregnant cats too? Yes, um, it does. We, you know, that's a debate that our staff has had too. We, with, after all of these years on the clinic, our vet and our two senior techs, they've been on that clinic since the start. And I'll be honest, they're getting, it's really disturbing for them now to do full-term pregnancies. So we don't do them anymore. They now, if the cat is too far along, the cat is turned away. Um, for cats that are in the early stages of a pregnancy, we do that usually if the client can afford it. There's an additional $15 to $30 surcharge, and that is to cover any additional pain meds that we use above and beyond what's part of the normal, typical protocol, and any long-acting antibiotics that they may need. But oftentimes, uh, and if it's the case of a feral cat, they are spayed no matter what, at whatever their reproductive condition, pregnant or not. And the feral cats are often not charged a surcharge unless it looks like the client can afford that. But it is based on need. We don't always get the extra. A uh, question one, from what? Go ahead, Sonia. Uh, I was going to say, do you want me to quickly share kind of what the typical rates are here in the valley? Sure thing. Excellent. Okay, so just real quickly, so um, for cats that are TNR'd at our main locations or through ADLA that runs our trap neuter return program, it typically is about $35. Uh, the female cats can be about $40, but typically they ask for the donation of $35 to $40 that will cover the male or the female. And if they're pregnant, any of those associated extra fees like cryptorchids, whether it's abdominal or just a regular bilateral. Uh, and then when we're talking about owned animals, we are lucky that we do have over 10 low cost spay neuter clinics here in Maricopa County alone. And they wow. typically charge $35 for a male owned cat. And then the females are typically around 45 to $50. Of course, those clinics do charge that extra if they're pregnant or, you know, crypt orchid, anything like that. Now through our voucher program and any animal that's spayed and neutered under fix it up, save, it is no cost to the community. That's wonderful. It's wonderful. So with that question, um, I have another question for Sonia. I'm going to go back to that topic. So hold that topic, but I, I want to make sure I ask this other question. Can you repeat your intake numbers again that you referenced? Uh, no, no problem. And actually that information can be found on our website, fixadoptsave.org. But in 2012, intake was over 87,000. As of 2018, it was a little bit below 50,000. And as of the end of 2019, which those stats will actually be put on our website tomorrow, it was just shy of 50,000. Hmm. So yes, and that's all primarily with the effort put forward of Spain and neutering. And on that graph, you'll be able to see all those key components. So you'll see intake, you'll see adoptions, euthanasia, and spay and neuter because we are very transparent. So all those numbers will be on there. Nice. It's good numbers. Donna, yeah, can you try turning your volume down just a smidgen? Sure. So you can still hear me, but a little less of an echo. Sonia, I, I want us to find out more about your fundraising strategies. So um, this, this is where I'm a little bit of the odd man out, um, and I do understand that. We are lucky as Fix Adopt Save is when our initiative was created, it was created with the backing of our two major funders. So we actually don't have to fundraise. I am given X amount of dollars every year, but I still have to prove what we're doing is effective. So even over the course of the time, like currently we actually just, you know, knowing um, what's taking place, We've decreased, frankly, all we can, and these numbers aren't gonna go down anymore. We're now at a maintenance level, and now we have to manage where we're at. Knowing our community and what took place and the stats we see in 2018, and then the ones that we just did in 2019, which again, those will be posted tomorrow, you'll be able to see things are actually leveling out now, and we know that that's, that's gonna be the baseline where we're gonna be at going forward. But our two primary funders, and everything is up on the website, is actually PetSmart Charities and also the Nina Mason Pulliam Charitable Trust. So yeah. 
I know it makes it, it makes it hard sometimes. <laughs> I feel bad for that part. But I love our funders. They knew what was taking place um, at that time as well too. When Fix It Up Safe did first start, we were Maricopa County was the second highest intake in the entire country. So that is why wow. that effort was put here. And we already had a coalition. That was the other part of it is Fix It Up Safe is encompassed by a coalition. So we have a municipality in there. We have the Humane Society. We have our local SPCA as well too. So we have multiple players that were already working together versus just one organization doing it. Because as you know, mm -hmm. one can't do it all. It has mm -hmm. to be a team effort. Well, Don, Donna's wearing the hat of one organization here. How are you yes. thinking about fundraising going forward? Oh my goodness. You know, yes, one hat, and I tend to wear a lot of hats here. Yep. So like all of us, um, it's pretty competitive here in Connecticut for funds. Um, we, you know, we should do more. I should do more. It's an area that I think our organization tends to be a bit weak in. Um, and I, I have no one but myself to blame for that and how many hours in a day. And I also don't like to do it, to be honest. Um, we have a very solid core donor base and I can appeal to them um, a few times a year, and we're actually going to do something because of COVID-19 that, that sort of reaches out and says, you've been supportive of us, you are always supportive, but this is an urgent situation that we're in. Um, we're hard hit, and so are the animals. Um, but as an organization, you know, we, we have that core base that brings in some money. We have a couple of grants that I will go for once in a while. But we do rely primarily on income from spay neuter. We do have a vaccination program uh, that provides booster vaccines. We have kitten packages for kittens. Um, we sell some products. If I, if I, you know, if, could I say that we have a really well thought out fundraising strategy in place? No. No. And if I could jump in with one more thing real quickly. Yeah. Um, and to that for our individual partners and all those I work with, because again, managing this definitely is like you, it's it's multiple hats I'm wearing from, you know, analyzing the data, making sure the program works, um, for bringing in all the partnerships, everything we do. Also working with all the individual organizations, they're exactly where everybody is. But fundraising has declined. It has dwindled down. As soon as this happened, multiple fundraisers were canceled because this is actually springtime is the, the, the time here in Arizona, especially March, April, and early May before it gets so hot that so many of the fundraisers were to take place that aren't happening anymore. Right. So a lot of the um, individual organizations are now doing the Giving Tuesday, are trying to be creative with, you know, weekly updates to their donor base and other people following them. But um, if I could throw this in, and I don't know how many um, in, in locations people following that this pertains to, but here in uh, the city of Phoenix, they actually, the individual cities do provide grants themselves. And a lot of the organizations are able to team up with other organizations that work within those cities and get grants. So even like our trap neuter return program, they work with multiple cities here within Maricopa County that are TNR specific, and they will get funds, you know, upwards of ten thousand dollars for each of those cities to put, you know, to put on a few mobiles and get animals fit. So all those little things, little neighborhood block watches, um, cities themselves contact them. A lot of them do have grants that a lot of our rescue community or spay and neuter clinics don't realize that you can actually get your hands on them. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, if I Donna. can just interject, I, I think, Sonia, you're absolutely right. Um, we do, if I would say we had any real fundraising strategy, we do so much at the grassroots level, whether it's through social media, email, our newsletter, that sort of thing. Um, but a lot of the funding sources, as you pointed out, have sort of dried up. Mm -hmm. And you have a lot of people going not only for the same small grant, amounts, but also the funders are starting to look in different directions. I don't find that Connecticut has as much available for animal welfare as it does for other types of programs. So that's a challenge too, you know? Yeah. I don't know if that's the case, Stacy, where you are. Well, I mean, there's certainly on the national level, spay neuter dollars have been right. redirected in other directions. Certainly, yeah. and then locally, a lot of it is 
family foundations or personal yeah. connections, sort of like leadership donor Correct. type situations. I would say the community foundations where mm-hmm. they may have given for like a certain area, target area, that might be a more challenging ask, especially at this point in time, unless you're trying to fund a pet food pantry or something like that, something more right. from that standpoint. The neuter isn't as sexy, I hate to say it, but there are other things that funders are more drawn to, whether it's homeless pets or food, pa- you know, pet food pantries. We do work with a couple of community foundations who help to support our rebate for feral cats on TNR and that sort of thing. Um, but again, that that is a challenge. Spay neuter in and of itself isn't really warm and fuzzy. Right. It's hard yeah. to get people, you know, in, if there's another component attached to it, like rescue or homelessness, homeless pets, that sort of thing. So we also, you know, have a lot of people going for the same money. Yeah. Yep. And from That's- a municipal standpoint, money is hard to come by. I mean, yep. the statewide voucher programs are wonderful and Massachusetts has one. Also, they're great. They're a great resource. But if you're talking about town by town, getting money from an individual town, it's no way. pretty, pretty That's- painful. Mm-hmm. Not in New England. Yeah. Different. No, it, it's true. It's frustrating. Yeah, but get creative, get those partnerships and make yep. it work the way those mm-hmm. grants say they'll fund it, then make it work that way. Yep. And as you right. said too, the individual leadership connections, you hate to say it, but estate planning, we have some of those folks and you don't want to see it coming anytime soon, but it's nice to know it might be out there. So let me ask you this question. Um, when do you think, and I'll ask uh, Sonia the question first, when do you think you will be back to operations as normal? Um, as in without restrictions for social distancing and all of that? So that's probably going to take a while because I think just seeing everything with the CDC requirements, everything's in phases. Um, what I've seen uh, here that uh, the governor has put out is social distancing is going to shrink in. So I think it's going to drop to maybe four-ish feet or whatnot in the coming weeks. So I think normal, normal, the way it was where you open up that lobby door and you see 10 people waiting to check in. Honestly, I think that's going to be months down the line, possibly you know late fall, if even then. Um, because again, as of right now, it is still what the CDC put out um, back in March and in April, first phase of changing that to allow more people gathering as well is gonna come in the next couple of weeks. And then it'll be you know another phase and another phase. So personally, mm-hmm. I think it's gonna be, I think we'll be lucky if we see it by September, it be normal like that, but I think more comfortable, probably October or later. And what do you think that will do to your intake numbers? That's what we're that's what we're nervous about. Um, luckily, because I also gather the data for the groups on a monthly basis, I'm able to track that and see that. So we're all, we already saw April. Um, we did see the number decrease, but of course that was because intake rules changed as well too. Where uh, anybody they were not taking owner intakes. Our municipality wasn't, nor was the Humane Society and a few others. So asking them to uh, take them. So we know this year. It'll be hard to say, oh, hey, this was our intake number. They dropped. This is fabulous. Well, we also know why that happened. So we are very realistic to that. Um, but we're going to see those intake numbers again drop because more people were asked to mm-hmm. keep those, um, their pets, you know, mm-hmm. a little bit longer if possible. And also anybody that found a stray, um, both the animal control, which is our, you know, our municipality, um, Humane Society, and a few others were asking people to just keep those pets in their home, foster in place until they were able to be contacted to start turning them in. Donna, what do you think? Connecticut, I hope, um, and I would say Dr. Heller, our vet, and I just talked about this today. I hope that our goal is to get back out on June 15th, as I said earlier. I hope we can. I hope that once the state restrictions ease up May 20th, people are already kind of going crazy, having events and doing all this stuff. And this is the Connecticut shoreline and it's gonna be summer on the shoreline. So the restaurants are already getting their outdoor dining and whatnot organized. I hope that we don't see it go right back up to scary numbers within the first two weeks after things ease up. In which case, we will probably be back off the road again. Um, My hope is that we can sort of limp along, for lack of a better word, this summer 
just going out a couple of days a week, doing restricted numbers and keeping under the radar so that everybody stays healthy and safe. But I have to agree with Sonia. I would be shocked if we were back to quote normal by the fall. I, I doubt it. My concern is that we're gonna be right back where we started in late March within a couple of weeks if we're not careful. Um, I know that doesn't sound very hopeful, but I think it's you just see what's staff. going on around. Mm -hmm. And we have to make sure you know. staff is comfortable as well too. Yeah. You know, as well as veterinarians, even though they're behind those closed doors, you know, the least amount of contact with the, you know, with human to human out front. But you know, they they want to make sure their staff is is comfortable exactly. as well. Too. And I think again, yeah. staff doesn't allow because we're all waiting for that, you know, second wave or to see what's going to happen. And again, here today actually they, is when. Uh, restaurants are, are starting to be opened so kind of like sit back and let's let's wait and see it is a wait and see um and again you know just due to our connecticut being a small and populated state in a very close proximity to new york and um boston and our own cities and uh i don't see as many people as i would like to following these guidelines i really don't i don't know um so fingers crossed, we just keep going, you know, hope for the best. So uh, just to let me know, I'm not sure, in Connecticut, are there any high volume spay neuter clinics, stationary clinics in Connecticut? Not, um, there are there are two. Um, we, we pretty much are the high volume, low cost service provider. There is a clinic in Stratford, Connecticut, which Stratford, Connecticut is in the middle of Fairfield County, which was the second most, second hotspot in the country, basically. Um, they have been closed since early March. Um, there is a clinic in East Hartford, Connecticut called Protectors of Animals that does low cost cat, both, both the Nutmeg Clinic in Stratford and Protectors of Animals do cats and dogs. Both of those clinics have been closed and are still closed. Um, Nutmeg might be getting ready to reopen, but really that's it. And from what I am gathering, just from my own anecdotal research and client calls and things that we get, you know, just kind of snooping around other clinics asking questions, the stationary private practices are not doing spay neuter, they're just doing emergencies. So that is the problem. They're really, there really isn't any alternative for folks. And that's what's scary to me. There's no place to go to get this done. Right, and then that's when we might see those intake numbers spike right. when those becoming pregnant now will have their litter right. next month, in turn, at the end of the year, being turned into the shelters. Right, so it's sad, you know, not only for the people who are getting hard hit, but um, for the animals. And, you know, the unemployment figures, again, I don't know how it is in Arizona, but Man, in Connecticut, the unemployment figures just keep going up, up, up. Here, so here there are more one. people. Pardon me? The here there are two? Well. Yeah. Yeah. And and when you have the um, getting the um, the PPP, but also if you did lay off or furlough employees and then they're getting that extra $600 a week, I understand there's sort of a disconnect there too, because in some cases, folks will make more money on unemployment than they would going back to their job. And so there's yeah. some stress, stresses there that's happening in some of the clinics too. Yes, that's that's a crazy one, but that that's very real. Um, and also we, you know, team was able to get that PPP loan that covers two months of payroll essentially, which is great, which if you don't lay anybody off, you don't, you may not have to, may not have to pay back. So. That's great, but you know, then you're looking at, well, what happens if we can't go back to work in June? Is there another one of those loans coming along or do you have to lay off? Right. Which I really, I, my, everybody that works in this business is so dedicated. The last thing you want to do is start laying people off, you know? That's I agree. That, yeah, and for us, again, those clinics, a few that did actually close down, uh, they were lucky enough when they opened back up just at the uh, end of April, April 30th, uh, they were lucky to get all the staff back. So, yes. So for us, it just yeah, feels finding, like we're in a rare pocket. Right. 
finding people to do this, we that's a, a challenge that I have here in Connecticut, um, is finding vets who want to do this work and finding techs who want to do it. Yep. And um, understanding for high volume, that, that's yep. also difficult because when I have to train others for that, right. it's, it's a, it's a lot, not just physical, but even emotional to understand the need and the importance of why high volume. It's not done for the bottom line. It, it's oh, done no, for right. the outcome at the end of the day. So it's definitely right. getting the, you know those few core people to understand that dedication and that physical part behind it as well, too. Definitely is. You throw a mobile on top of that, having that, to oh, yeah. that's drive how out I have and the mobile. <laughs> That's the that's the yeah. that's the icing on the cake too, because that adds a whole nother element oh, yeah. of challenge to it. Yeah. And, you know, and hoping, and down, hoping it down. starts up in the morning and all that stuff. I mean, on the cold winter mornings with the mobile clinic, you hold your breath before you turn that key. So. <laughs> For us, it was finding shady when it's 110. <laughs> no, it's same difference. Yeah, we we sort of joke about that. I guess it's not really that funny in our organization though, because. You know, Dr. Heller, myself, and, and my two techs, we've been here pretty much from the start. And as I said before, we're all getting to be a little bit, you know, of a certain age. And we thought, what's going to happen when one day we just can't, you know, the techs are like, I just can't lift and spend another 40, you know, 30 cat day. There's the whole question, which is, doesn't have to do with the pandemic, but the question of succession is a big one. Yeah, that's, um, it, it even doesn't have to deal with age. It's, how right. early almost some begin and get wore out because we're just emotional exactly because even at my yeah. age at 43 i can't do what i was doing you know my late 20s even 10 years ago you know where yeah no. it's okay to pick up a 60 pound dog i'm gonna pick him up i'm gonna move him i'm gonna do you know 110 cat clinic not a problem now i'd be like can somebody help <laughs> that's exactly it you know it's, it's, it's a big I mean, difference yeah you know, you can only be hardcore for so long and then yeah. you're like, oh, I'm exhausted. Yeah. Exactly. So mentally, physically, whatever. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But Sonia, you seem to know, you know, all the different shapes and sizes yeah. of spay neuter environments, yes. you know, from the mobile to the stationary. Yes. Uh, what's your experience with like large scale MASH style clinic? Have you worked in that environment? And, and do you see that being feasible going forward at all in the near future, even some sort of a hybrid? Um, so yeah, so I guess the question is, um, if you consider MASH style more of the old school way, you know, everything recovers in a gym, that type of situation, um, then yeah, those are actually still utilized quite a bit. Um, not so much in Maricopa County, because we have so many different programs that that isn't necessary here. But we do put on large scale events. So actually through Fix It Up Safe um, and the funding, I host an event once a year, which this year we were lucky enough. We did it two weekends before COVID-19, before, before the coronavirus hit, in where we provide 900 free spay and neuter surgeries um, in one weekend. So I have five locations across the valley that do bring out mobile units. And what I will do at that time is um, one location in particular, my Avondale location, we have three units. This year we had four. We have some tents erected and inside is where I do contract staff and they're all um, technicians as well too. So they're all experienced technicians that work with the mobile units and we house the animals within those tents. So both for check-in prior to surgery and for recovery, all of it is done in their individual tents. So we do that even though in one way we do provide free spay and neutering through, you know, throughout the year. Fix it up, save ourselves. We fund over eight thousand a year. So, and that, that's a stat I realized I didn't mention before. So, we provide over eight thousand surgeries for both cats and dogs um, combined per year through the Fix It Up Save members. All the clinics that are part of our coalition, um, we actually uh, provide over forty thousand a year of spay and neuters here in the valley. But we know with this event. Um, there's still those people that it's just like a mobile who aren't going to make that appointment, aren't going to, mm -hmm. you know, want to do all that. So you still have to sprinkle those surprise events, those big days, maybe throw in a thing or two extra. So for that day, we throw in the pain medication and the e-callers, those few little things that frankly don't cost us too much more. And then we really draw them in. So in a way, the need as in a detrimental life-saving need isn't necessarily needed, but we still have to have it to get to be able to get those few people out there that wouldn't get that spay or neuter otherwise. Mm -hmm. So 
so and then in other counties, um, like in Yuma uh, years ago, where I assisted them with kind of the same situation, I know out in the reservations, there are some mobiles that do work with them, again, providing that match style type of um, type of assistance where they'll do every all of that stuff. Um, those do still take place. Um, Houston actually does provide on a quarterly basis. Um, or sorry, I apologize, twice a year, um, and they want to move into something a little bit more different, where they do bring in, um, you know, some mobile, some other extra assistance and things like that. But what most people know of doing it that way, like the Puerto Rico thing, you know, where you have, and you're buying equipment, you're buying anesthesia machines, all of that, that out here just isn't taking place because there really isn't that need for that, because we have so many mobiles as well, too, that we work with, or that are available. But do you see that happening in the socially distanced world that we're living in now? Um, so those events, so no, no, sorry. Sorry if I digress into something else. Um, so actually right now, no, all those are being halted because those events purposely draw out mass people. You know, it's, a, it's an event for mass people. So no, those are being halted. And actually that includes our own events. So I actually also have funding and I provide on a monthly basis a free uh, vaccination and free microchip clinic uh, once a month for 200 animals in a four hour time frame. But when all this started, we had to halt our services for April and now May. But with this heat, we can't do anything until possibly October and November. Wow. Makes me so I, sad. I know. It's hard <laughs> because we use those events to basically reel in the people who have been considering spay neutering but maybe didn't want to do it. So we bring them in with a free vac, you know, with free vaccines and microchips. And frankly, while they're our captive audience. We mm -hmm. then talk to them about spay and neuter, and we actually do see about 70% of the people we assist at those events whose animals are not altered return back to ask for information on how to get their pet altered or the assistance to do it. And we do provide the certificates at those events as well. So it is, it's very difficult to have those be put on hold. Mm -hmm. Hmm. All right. Well, I'm going to do a couple of polls um, before we close out just to get a sense of where people, how people are feeling today. Day. How long do you feel we'll be dealing with this? One to two months, three to four months, five plus months, or too long to even think about right now? Kristen will like this question. I do like this question. I've loved watching it change from, from meeting to meeting over the last few weeks. It's been it's been nice. It's uh it's very nerve wracking. Yeah. Definitely not having a date makes like the whole thing a little bit more stressful. So how long do you feel we'll be dealing with this? 6% say one to two months, 6% say three to four months, 50% say five plus months, 38% say too long to even think about right now. We just don't know. So this has been, this figure has moved out every time I've run this poll. It's gotten longer yeah. and longer. So the more we know, the longer it gets, which is, which means we really have to think, rethink our businesses. It's a whole different business model now, that's for sure. Um, and then I am going to do um, this one here. How are you feeling? Great. I think I can. Ha we can handle whatever comes our way. Good. Not sure this is going to be pretty, but we'll make it. And very anxious. I'm losing sleep at night. Um, all right, I'm going to close this poll, share the results. How are you feeling? Nobody's great today. Maybe it's their brain. I don't know. <laughs> but 77% of people feel good. Not sure this is going to be pretty, but we'll make it. 23% are very anxious. I'm losing sleep at night. Um, and I, I'm, I understand those, those thoughts too. So thank you very much for participating and sharing in these polls. I have plenty more polls, but I will hold back and not do more <laughs> polls. But um, I want to do a take a, a minute here to uh, certainly thank Sonia and Donna for sharing their thoughts, their um, comments. They, it's been a great conversation. I actually think this is probably one of the best panels we've had. So I appreciate them coming and sharing their expertise. I'm just incredibly impressed yeah. with what they've been able to accomplish and done over the years. So a big shout out and thank you to them. And I also want to do a thank you and shout out to all of the folks who've been attending. There's so many 
frequent names. You've been here with me on Saturdays and Mondays regularly for about the last month and five weeks or so. And I want to thank everybody for tuning in to the um, the Community Cats pop-up panels, um, spay, neuter, in the time of COVID-19, call it what you want. Um, so I want to thank everybody. And please feel free to email me at stacy at communitycatspodcast.com. Please tune in to our podcast, which is weekly. It comes out every Tuesday. I have a newsletter that comes out on Thursday. Make sure you're a subscriber. Tune in. Please share with others. If we can't get them spayed and neutered, if you can at least share information with others and maybe just get everybody prepared, all those kittens and cats that aren't going to be spayed and neutered, that are going to be given to people, friends and family, let's just get out there and educate as much as possible mm -hmm. so we can hopefully get them spayed and neutered. Um, I, I know we feel like we're all stuck. We can't do much of anything, but maybe outreach is our, our best hope at this point in time until we can get get up and running. Uh, I will say as a side note, I have been listening to quite a few professional veterinary association webinars, and there's not much conversation about stopping, spaying, and neutering. So I know Donna mentioned that in Connecticut that the veterinary practices had stopped doing spaying and neutering. Yes. In Massachusetts, there are some that are still doing it. So um, I think it's a very case-by-case -case basis with regards mm -hmm. to who the owner of the practice is and probably also the leadership of the, um, the state veterinary association. Most people are probably following that lead. So certainly check around in your state because the private practices may still be doing spays and neuters. I know it's not going to be at a reasonable price from our perspective, but it'll be something, but mm -hmm. I think we're really, we got to figure out a way through this um, and figure out a way to try and operate safely and still be able to get some surgeries done too. So um, again, I appreciate everybody coming to these and the panels, it's been fun. And um, I may bring them back in about a month's time and see where we're at. If you all feel that that's a good idea feel free to let me know, but uh, this will be up, this will be recorded and it'll be up on YouTube probably in a week or so. Kristen will uh, let me know and I'll let you know when the uh, when the replays are out and uh, on YouTube. So anyway, thank you, thank you everybody and have thank a good you. day. Thank right. you very much for inviting me.